بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له هو الأول دون بداية وهو الآخر دون نهاية لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا رسول الله مرسل رحمة للعالمين خاتم الأنبياء والرسل أجمعين اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك عليه على الرسول المصطفى على الحبيب محمد وعلى آله الأطهار الميامين وعلى أصحابه المختارين وعلى من اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحان الله نؤمن به ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستجيره ونستنصره فإنه حق من هدى الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له اللهم يا رب العالمين يا سميع يا عليم يا من هو أقرب إلينا من حبل الوريد اصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا واصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا واصلح لنا آخرتنا التي فيها معادنا واجعل الحياة زيادة لنا في من كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر لا إله إلا أنت In essence, in essence, the sum total of our journey on this earth, the sum total of this miraculous event that gives us consciousness and we enjoy this consciousness for a period of time until it slips away. And the truth of the matter is with all the speculation and all the attempts at insight and perception.
what awaits us after this consciousness slips away is only known truly to God and God alone. After this consciousness slips away, is it a state of sleep until resurrection? Do we acquire some kind of consciousness, some level of consciousness after death? What type of consciousness? What level of consciousness? In what dimension of existence? If any, does it start upon entering the grave? Does it begin right after death? Does it begin a period after death? After death, are we aware of our loved ones? Do we know when our loved ones pass away? Do they join us in death? Or are we separated forever until resurrection? Because we are human beings that are often so vain and so silly, all we know is that consciousness granted to us. It is a miraculous puzzle, truly beyond comprehension. All the time that preceded us is incomprehensible to us. All the time that comes after us is truly incomprehensible to us. What is the fate of the molecules that constituted your body? Even if they transform in the simple belly of an earthworm, do these molecules last forever? Matter doesn't vanish, it transforms. Is it relevant? Is it entirely irrelevant? the amazing puzzle of consciousness. A gift from the Almighty given to you with this window of opportunity to understand, to comprehend as much as you can for a limited period of time that slips away ever so quickly. Ever so quickly. Everyone living hears of the death of friends, of family, of acquaintances, and our silly ego refuses to acknowledge that but for the grace of God, this could be you. If death misses you this time, well, it, just, it could be right around the corner. And your opportunity 
that gift of consciousness that was given to you so that you can comprehend and understand more than a piece of rock thrown in a swamp or laying in the desert or settled upon a beach. The difference between you and that piece of rock is the opportunity that Allah, God, grants you. And don't ponder consciousness because it is truly incomprehensible. With all our posing about scientism and objectivism and empiricism, there is no way that science or philosophy is capable of understanding consciousness. Moreover, there is no way that science or philosophy is capable of understanding time. Where does time come from? Where does time go? We speculate about the formation of planets over courses of billions of years but we never have an answer for the beginning. And we can never have an answer about the end, if there is an end. You can waste the gift of consciousness. You can be like someone who goes to Las Vegas and gambles. You gamble, you take a risk. But remember, the nature of gambling is that ultimately all those who gamble are losers and the house always wins. That's the law of gambling, the irony of gambling. Go ahead and gamble. Go ahead and say, although I understand nothing about where I came from, and I understand nothing about where I'm going, I understand nothing about time, I understand nothing about consciousness, I will gamble that there is no God. And I will gamble that even if there is a God, this God will say, I'm not going to hold you accountable for all the crap that you've done in your life. Be a Las Vegas gambler. The house always wins. The house always wins. So you waste this consciousness. You could spend the entire gift of consciousness hoarding material things, watching your bank account grow, indulging in power, controlling other human beings, abusing other human beings, taking advantage of creation, taking advantage of the environment, taking advantage of living things and unliving things, being a jerk, being a narcissist, being self-centered, being a jerk. Go ahead. 
take the gamble. But you know what? Believers will tell you when you've gambled everything and life has slipped away and you meet your God after death, you will look back at the gift of consciousness and there will be nothing, nothing at that point left but memories and regret. You can cry, you can beg, you can try to remember the few good things that you've done in life. You can plead your case. But I wasn't that bad. Yes, I was selfish, but there were many others who were worse than me. You will be at the mercy of the God that you spent a lifetime ignoring. At that point, when all the bets are called, all the bets are called, you will be pleading your case, begging for the mercy of the God that you spent your consciousness mistreating. being oblivious to, being rude towards, being heedless towards. You're going to be telling this God, yes, I treated you like garbage, but please, I was a good person anyway. Or you could choose to believe that this is all a fairy tale. And you are just like that rock. You don't understand anything about anything. And that's the way you live, and that's the way you die, and you gamble. And go ahead, gamble. Because students of the Quran will tell you, Allah has always told us, man sha'a fal yu'min wa man sha'a fal yakfur. If you choose to believe, go ahead. If she choose not to believe, go ahead. What does Allah want you to do with your consciousness? What does Allah want you to do with that gift? Well, the rules of this game are clear. You must be cognizant of the fact that you don't own yourself. You are already owned by your maker. You don't belong to yourself. Your title over yourself is invalid. God has title over you. God has title over your consciousness, over your body, over your will. And that maker told you the first rule is humility towards the one who owns you. Don't go around like a little moronic tyrant believing that you owe no one nothing or that you owe nothing to anyone. That's idiocy. 
That's arrogance. You owe everything to your maker. Your dignity comes from your maker. Your honor comes from your maker. Your worth comes from your maker. But so does the dignity and honor and worth of everyone else. The first rule is listen very carefully, very carefully to what your owner wants you to do in life. Don't go around pretending that your maker is not speaking. That's rude. Don't go around pretending that your maker has nothing to say to you. That's extremely rude. Don't go around thinking or pretending that you are smarter than your maker. That's insolent and blasphemous. You are not smarter than your maker. You don't know better than your maker. Humble yourself and teach yourself to listen carefully. Second, because everyone has equal worth, everyone has equal honor, everyone has equal dignity, your maker wants you to bear witness. I've given you this consciousness so you can bear witness as to what is right and what is wrong. It is the exact negation of a heedless, pointless life. No. The point of your consciousness is not to hoard material things. The point of your consciousness is not to have fun. The point of your consciousness is not to distract yourself in as many distractions as you can possibly find. The point of your consciousness is not to subdue and waste that consciousness. People who drink, people who take drugs, what they do with their consciousness is abuse that consciousness. The point of your consciousness is so that you are shuhada lillah. You bear witness for God, on behalf of God. Only Allah knows whether you could have truly changed what is wrong. That's something that you and Allah will settle in the hereafter. But at a minimum, was your consciousness engaged in the process of witnessing what is wrong and witnessing and testifying for what is right? Were your existence superfluous to existence? It doesn't matter whether other people are impressed by your testimony. It doesn't even matter if they listen to your testimony. Your audience is one. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
It doesn't matter if the entire world ignores you. Did you bear witness for God? What an opportunity. Consciousness, an utter mystery, complete mystery, an incomprehensible mystery, and as mysteriously as it comes, it will mysteriously disappear. And all that will be left is the sum total of moments of witnessing and testimony. That's it. When Allah talks about a book that each of us will carry in the hereafter, This is the book of Shahada, the book of what you've witnessed to, the book of your testimony. You testify through your actions. That's your testimony. You testify through your actions. If you say, I care about the poor, what do you do about poverty? If you say, I care about orphans, well, how do you help orphans? It makes our life far more meaningful but it also reminds us that we carry a serious burden, a serious burden, because the maker of this life, the maker of this mystery of existence, the mystery of eternity, the mystery of time, the mystery of consciousness, the one who is beyond science because of all the mysteries that science is incapable of even approaching. That maker has defined the meaning of life. That maker said, I didn't create you so that you will indulge and often indulge at the cost, at the expense of others. I've created you so you can bear witness, so that you can be shuhada. Lillah. Bear witness. Bear witness. Kulu kawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum uskurullah ya istajib lakum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa subhanallahi al-Ali al-Azim. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala al-Habib al-Mustafa Muhammad. المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Bearing witness is often a challenge because when you truly bear witness it's not a popularity contest and often when you bear witness to truth, people who struggle with darkness in their heart 
can't stand to hear the truth. Recently, in New Mexico, in Albuquerque, four Muslims were murdered. shot to death. We were all horrified as we followed the news of the murder of these four Muslims. And most of us immediately expected that this must be Islamophobic. And then the police arrested a Muslim fellow from Afghanistan, a man who used to be in the Afghani special forces, a member of the Afghani army that was funded and trained and armed by the United States, that man fought against the Taliban. And when the Taliban eventually won in Afghanistan, he immigrated to the United States. When they stopped his car, they found an AK rifle and guns, and they said that the caliber, the police said that the caliber the bullets that killed the four men came from the guns owned by this fellow. This fellow claims he's innocent. And he is entitled to the presumption of innocence until tried and granted his due process. And we will respect that because we must respect that. But the killing of these four men raises a very important point. All four were Shia Muslims. And it is suspected that this man was upset that his daughter married a Shia Muslim. So he decided to kill Shia Muslims in his local mosque. His daughter finds it very difficult to believe that her father would kill anyone. And, her, and his daughter said, well, he was very upset, but recently he was more accepting towards the marriage. The issue that it raises for me is one of the ugliest topics. One of the topics that really tests the metal of your morality and ethics. The division between Shia and Sunnah. At the outset, if you are a fair witness, you must admit that the most of the acts of terrorism in which innocents are killed are committed by Sunnis against Shia. It is not the Shia who have blown themselves up in Sunni mosques in Iraq or Afghanistan, but nearly in every case, it is a Sunni who chose to blow himself up in the midst of Shia worshipers.
It is obscene. It is disgusting. I hear what my fellow Sunnis say about the Shia. And I fight back the urge to throw up. I read that Hezbollah committed atrocities against Sunnis in Syria. And if that is true, I condemn Hezbollah for these atrocities. And I wish there is a way to hold them responsible for every atrocity. But if they are not held responsible on this earth, they will be held responsible in the hereafter. Of that, I am sure. But that in itself doesn't address the obscenity of the division between Sunnis and Shia. Let's take a step back. And cut to the core of the matter. There was a political disagreement after the death of the Prophet The political disagreement was about who should succeed the Prophet as the ruler and governor. Regardless of the merits of the disagreement, it is Abu Bakr that ruled, then Omar, then Uthman, and then Ali. The thing though, whether Sunni or Shia, we all agree that Ali was not treated well. And Ali, despite his esteemed position as the Prophet's cousin, Sunni and Shia agree that Ali confronted betrayal after betrayal after betrayal. So where is the problem? The problem is that after Muawiyah, came to power. Muawiyah, in order to consolidate his power, killed many esteemed companions of the Prophet ﷺ that supported Ali. Despite that, many Sunni scholars in history defended the credibility and morality of Muawiyah. And although Muawiyah decreed that Ali, the Prophet's cousin, be condemned the practice of cursing Ali on the pulpits of Jum'ah, probably began with Yazid, in my opinion, and not Muawiyah. Although historians can disagree. But for a hundred years, it was illegal to praise the family of the Prophet. It was illegal to support the family of the Prophet. It was illegal to say anything favorable about Imam Ali. And from those initial hundred years, fanaticism and radicalism was born. Within the Shi'i tradition emerged fanatic orientations 
that didn't just disagree with Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Aisha, didn't just believe that they erred, but would affirmatively, affirmatively curse them and consider them apostates. The crux of the matter, the heart of the matter, Sunnis want to believe that all the companions of the Prophet were of equal merit. And they cling to the Hadith that all my companions were like stars. Whoever you follow, you are truly guided. Although the Hadith whether chain of transmission or substantively, is extremely problematic. Because you would only accept such hadith if you really didn't know the seerah of all the companions of the Prophet. Because you need to first define who's a companion. There are some of those people who converted after Fath Makkah and who coexisted with the Prophet for a few months before he passed away, who did horrible things and cannot possibly be like stars that could guide you. I'm here to tell you that if you actually read Shia sources, that respectable Shia clerics urge their followers to refrain from the practice of cursing any of the companions. Not because they like these companions, but because it's haram to be obscene. And it's haram to slander those who you truly have no way of having direct knowledge. These are people who did not slaughter and murder like Yazid did. But even if there are Shia that engage in the reprehensible practice of cursing the, of cursing the companions, These are not grounds. These are not grounds. These are not grounds for calling them apostates or considering their life worthless. Even if Your recourse, if you find someone cursing Aisha or Abu Bakr or Omar, is to tell them that is not a rational argument. I will not engage you if your path is the path of obscenities. You want to talk history, we can talk history. And in fact, all I can say is may Allah guide you. Allah yihdiq. But it's not grounds for considering them as if they follow a different religion. They say the shahada. They follow the same God. They follow the same prophet. They follow the same Quran despite all the nonsensical Sunni inventions about supposed Shia secret Quran. And you who engage in this type of ignorance and hatred are nothing but pawns in the hands of the manipulators of power. 
in the hands of the elite in the Emirat and the elite in Saudi who want you to make friends with those who occupy Al-Aqsa and hate those who say Ashhadu anna la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan rasulullah wa anna aliyan waliyullah so what? They believe that Ali is Waliullah, and I believe Ali is Waliullah. Of course, Ali was Waliullah. Any truly pious Muslim who dedicates their life to serving Allah is Waliullah. Abu Bakr was Waliullah. Omar was Waliullah. And Ali was Waliullah. So what? You have a brief gift of consciousness. And you sully it. And dishonor it. And disfigure it. With ignorance and hate. and false, irresponsible testimony. I will close with something that I cannot ignore. And I cannot be silent about. And I will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I will bear witness against all of you who are silent about this, one by one. If you follow Israeli media, Israeli media celebrated the Israeli assassination of Ibrahim al Nabulsi. Ibrahim al Nabulsi was a 17 year old kid. A 17 year old kid who had never actually engaged in an act of terrorism. Israel said, because he joined jihad, just the mere fact, he's not entitled to due process, and he's not entitled to life, and he's not entitled to anything. We can just murder him. And so Israel sent its special anti-terror unit to assassinate Ibrahim and Nabulsi. Before Ibn Nahir Ibrahim and Nabulsi died, he took his phone and the 17 year old recorded a message to his mother. And in this message in Arabic, he told her mother, his mother, I love you. And don't cry. We will meet in Jannah. I know that the Israelis are coming to kill me. Israel killed Ibrahim and Nabulsi. And as Ibrahim and Nabulsi tried to defend himself, he killed a dog a dog that's trained by the Israeli special forces. The dog's name was Zili. Channel 12 in Israel and politicians and activists eulogized the brave Dog Zili, 
celebrated the life and death of the brave dog Zili. But no one bothered to talk about the 17-year-old who actually never had an opportunity in a court of proper law. The entire world ignored the murder. But as Israel eulogized Zili the dog, not only did they ignore Ibrahim and Nabulsi, but they also ignored the 23-year-old woman, innocent woman, who was killed. And they also ignored the five-year-old girl, Taysir al-Jabbari, who was also murdered by the Israeli special forces. Not a single outlet in Israel said, the life of this five-year-old or the 23-year-old, 23-year-old, innocent bystanders. Is even comparable to life, the life of Zili the dog. And after this, the jihad retaliated firing rockets that ultimately didn't kill any Israelis. And Israel, as we all know, responded by killing tens of Palestinians, including 16 children by the last count that I am aware of. And still, the Israeli media, the only thing they have to say about it is to talk about the bravery of Zili the dog. And they have nothing to say about the Palestinian children or their families that were killed or the innocent Palestinians that were maimed. Wow. Wow. What a world we live in. What do we do with this consciousness? What are you testifying to? What are you bearing witness to? How many imams in how many jummahs have even noticed? You know what? I mourn Zili the dog. I really do. Because that poor dog had no beef in this fight. The poor dog had no ideology. The poor dog was trained to protect his owners and gave his life to protect him he perceived to be a threat to his owners. But I have the morality and the ethics and the decency to also mourn the human beings that Israel kills and the United States, my government, is blissfully ignores and the rest of the world blissfully ignores. The racism is deafening. The bigotry is suffocating. And the Muslim silence is unbearable. The Muslim silence is unbearable. May Allah forgive me and forgive you. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إني داع فأمن اللهم اغفر لنا اللهم اعف عنا 
اللهم ارحمنا يا رب العالمين اللهم اهدنا لأقرب من هذا رشدا يا الله يا رب العالمين Allah forgive our sins guide us towards the straight path be our aid and our light and our guide and help us bear testimony bear witness in truthfulness in bravery in honesty and to be steadfast witnesses on your behalf our maker our owner our lord يا الله يا علي يا عظيم وصلي وسلم وبارك على محمد وأقم الصلاة